morning, uh, listening to my mentor, uh, Dr. Hattendorf, uh, talk about uh, Lieutenant McCarty Little's promotion. I vehemently protest, having been uh, assigned here as a lieutenant many years ago, not being pro uh, promoted to captain and kept on till the age of 83. So I just wanted to register my, uh, register my discontent with that. Let's, uh, let's move on. Sea power is a conscious political choice. In order to figure out what sea power means today, what strategies we need to draw up in order to make it a reality, and what forces, resources, and manpower we need to amass in order to make those, make those uh, strategies a reality, there's no better place to, to start off than with the great works of maritime strategy and of strategic theory writ large. So with that, uh, we have assembled a, a fine panel to, to get us started off on the right foot at our conference this morning. Uh, we have three speakers as you see from your program. Uh, Nick Lambert, sitting to my right, uh, insists on depicting himself as an international man of mystery. Uh, he's a two-time graduate of Oxford University and uh, author most recently of Planning Armageddon, a book on British economic warfare in the First World War. Uh, to his right, we have Professor Captain Bud Cole from National War College. Uh, he's the author of, the, author of uh, the Great Wall at Sea. Any of you China watchers out there will be uh, intimately familiar with it. It's been a fixture on the Navy reading list. Uh, and in, in China Maritime Studies more, more uh, broadly for many years now. And finally, we, not, last but not least, we have uh, Barney Robo, retired Captain Robo, Dean of the uh, Center for Naval Warfare Studies here at the Naval War College. Uh, but Barney, you, many of you will be familiar with him from the making of the 2007 Maritime Strategy. He oversaw the research and the, the gaming that went into the making of that strategy, which was unveiled here back in 2007. Uh, so with that, why don't I go ahead and turn over to Nick. I, I think the, the, the rules of the game, I think I can afford uh, 10 to 15 minutes per speaker if they choose to take that long. Uh, then I will rattle on for five or 10 minutes with some commentary and that should leave us with about a half an hour of Q&A at the end, uh, which will be the most important uh, thing that we will do here this morning. With that, Professor Lambert, whatever you, whatever you oh, choose I think to do. If you can sit because they're recording. Okay. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Ian by thanking Dex Wilson and Derek Rudder for inviting me here. Um, I'm not sure quite uh, what I was expecting to bring my economist or my historian hat. Um, you would think by uh, looking at the title of the paper I gave that it was going to be this probably a good idea. Uh, what is it? Classical theories of sea power and world economic systems. Uh, I suppose I should apologize for including the word economics in the title. I should know better. Uh, the last book I wrote was called uh, Planning Armageddon, British Economic Warfare in the First World War. And one of the first things the press said to me is, do you absolutely have to have the word economics in the title? I said, well, why? And they said, well, it typically slashes potential sales by 50% and uh, switches everybody off. Um, but what, what could I say? Yes, it's about economic warfare, and I couldn't come up with another term that's appropriate, so it stuck there. Um, I've been asked to say something about the uh, great maritime theorists, uh, which brings back memory of the last time I spoke here, 24 years ago. Um, and the title of that conference was called uh, Mahan is Not Enough. And it was actually a conference all about uh, extolling the virtues of the English theorists, uh, Julian Corbett and Herbert Richmond, and one or two others. I think there's one other veteran in the room, um, Joanna Hattendorf. No, he's not in the room. He was looking over there a moment ago. Uh, anyway, the only one who will remember this. In any case, um, the, over the last 24-odd uh, uh, years, I've been reading and thinking about uh, Mahan and Corbett a great deal more. And uh, I've really come to the conclusion that maybe Mahan is not enough, but in fact he is the best we've got. Um, I'm not going to read uh, my paper. Uh, I've made substantial revisions to it at 5 o'clock this morning. Um, as is always the way with any academic. Um, bottom line, I mean, really, in, in gist, um, in case you didn't do your homework, um, you know, I, I, one of the big difficulties in talking about any of these uh, maritime theories is uh, sifting the wheat from the chaff. Um, and each of these uh, historians, or if they are historians, uh, produced, what, 20 volumes, 100 plus articles and polemics. Uh, their volumes are absolutely riddled with subtexts. Uh, you have to know a great deal about uh, contemporary arguments, contemporary debates, to be able to decipher and make sense about an awful lot of what they say. 
Um, so it really does require considerable expertise and knowledge of long forgotten debates to correctly decipher uh, their messages. Um, also, one has to take consideration the sheer span of their careers. I mean, typically it's a quarter of a century for each of them. And uh, much happened in this uh, quarter of a century for both of them. Um, so when Mahan you know, first published uh, his first volume in 1890, uh, you know, who was the United States' hereditary enemy? The United Kingdom. Uh, they were the first draft of War Proud Red. And when he died in uh, 1914, who was still the hereditary enemy? Probably Great Britain, uh, judging by the fact that uh, when he died in December of 1914, it was looking like the United States and Britain were going to go to war, or heading in that direction, shall we say, um, um, over disputes over uh, maritime rights. So it was 1812 all over again. Um, certainly there was no uh, special relationship or uh, benevolent neutrality being displayed by Woodrow Wilson towards uh, Britain fighting in its war against uh, fascist Germany. Um, anyway, but, but of course, there, there's a vast outpouring. So much has changed. Um, when you're looking at the works of both of these men, um, on the surface, they appear to be very much saying very much the same thing. Uh, in fact, they're not at all. They really have fundamentally different approaches. Um, their very definitions of the word strategy differ quite dramatically. Um, but really what I want to get to is, is they have a very different world views, which is a, um, a reflection of their different emphasis on or an understanding of the world economic system and uh, its, uh, the significance of the world economic system and its relationship to shaping what you might call the strategic environment in which navies operate. Um, Mahan's first book, as I sort of explained, was very carefully structured and it's predicated upon his key idea, which is that there is a close correlation between sea commerce and wealth generation and national strength, the power of the firm. Uh, I could talk at great lengths, it's very interesting, his later writings. Um, he becomes increasingly interested in global economics and increasingly convinced of their importance. Um, there is, uh, he differentiates, I, I know that he's often thought of man who denigrates and disparages Goethe Kors, um, which you might think is uh, strange, uh, but he did, drew a very clear uh, distinction between commerce protection and Goethe Kors. Uh, the problem is, is he found his audiences uh, not exactly receptive to subtle differences. Uh, there's a wonderful exchange of correspondence with Theodore Roosevelt about 1904 where he's saying, yes, I know I haven't changed my mind on the main point. Yes, I don't believe in Gig again, of course, but uh, commerce uh, prevention is something very, very different. Um, he, um, in, as I say, uh, he has been criticized by an awful lot of people for not being systematic in defining what he meant by sea power, but there's no question he's very clear as to what it was all about. Um, you know, sea power is synonymous with the economics of the sea in his mind. Uh, Julian Corbett, again, parallels Mahan on the surface, but very different points of departure. Um, generally speaking, um, whereas Mahan is focused on the big questions, the big pe picture, um, Corbett is much more interested in uh, discussing the narrow, much, much more narrow operational focus, the how the Navy uh, achieves uh, command of the sea. Uh, Corbett, uh, yes, he uses the language of economics in a few places, but he's very unsure, very uncertain. Uh, for him, it's a secondary consideration. Uh, it's quite contradictory in places, but fundamentally, it's based upon you know, his understanding of economics is based upon 18th century understanding of how the global trading system actually operated. Um, and he was outdated in his own day, as in, in consequence, in strategic matters at least, he was largely ignored. ignored. Which brings us back to Mahan. As I say, he's not really a historian as such back in the um, turn of the century, last century. Um, a story in a very broad church organization uh, could mean a lot of things. Uh, he's much more of a geopolitician. Uh, I came across Teddy Roosevelt's obituary, um, which actually described Mahan as more of a statesman. He described him as a statesman of first rank. And he said he's much more interested in strategy uh, than in tactics. Uh, interesting by what he meant by the word strategy. It's uh, strategy is geopolitics his grand strategy, uh, that's what he meant by the term. Um, again, Mahan is uh, very closely associated with the leading statesmen of the day, uh, Elihu Root, John Hay, Harry Cabot Lodge, and of course, Teddy Roosevelt. 
Uh, and much more interestingly, he's very closely, uh, he's in connection, he's in communication with their leading economic advisors, who would include Arthur Hadley at Yale, uh, Jeremiah Jenks, Cornell, and Charles Conant. Um, this seems to have, I don't know, it's, it, it, it's very interesting. He seems to have had a grasp or a fundamental grasp or an instinctive grasp of uh, economics. Um, it's uh, much more, most apparent when um, Mahan is looking into the future and Corbett as well. You know, Corbett says is the commerce prevention, it's, become, it's going to become less and less significant over the time. Uh, Mahan is saying the exact opposite. He's, going to, he's saying it's going to become much, much more important. Sea power is going to be a much more important quality as time goes by. Uh, his later volumes, there's this wonderful vivid metaphor that he knows about in the French Revolutionary volume, where he describes it as an organic, complex, dynamic being. Uh, he, um, he actually writes, as I say, this correspondence, uh, Mahan to uh, Teddy Roosevelt in December of four. He says that the power to control commerce, the lawful right, uh, international uh, preced uh, precedents now hamper, probably right on that, is maybe of immense, even decisive importance in future war. But really, what is actually Mahan saying and what's he talking about? Um, really, what I think he is talking about uh, is grappling with the strategic implications of what we now call today uh, globalization. Um, this is at the time, late 1890s, early 1900s, there's a growing perception of a transformation in the global economic system. Um, something really different has emerged um, subsequent to the development of telecommunications, uh, trans uh, a list of a whole raft of factors. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to think. Anyway, as a result of the, this transformation, uh, basically um, the economic well-being of whole societies has increasingly come to depend upon a highly optimized economic system which is itself dependent upon access to the infrastructure of the global trade, and especially upon access to real-time communications, uh, particularly in industrialized nation states with uh, large urbanized populations. Uh, the society, uh, societal and political stability really required high levels of economic prosperity, uh, made possible uh, by the steady flow of uh, goods and staples through the global trading system. Now, at the most basic level, urban populations needed a steady supply of food how much is actually in the city on the shelves, uh, very, very little. Um, producers, of course, are dependent upon selling their produce in a constant stream of commerce. And if it starts to pile up on the wharves or in, in the ports, uh, they're in deep trouble quickly, uh, largely because of the credit financing. Uh, and of course, equally uh, in trouble will be the banking system that extended the loans to begin with. Uh, the, um, at the same time, as I said, the, the strategic implications of all this are being considered. Um, most uh, prominent among these is a man called Ivan Bloch. I can talk about him, fascinating character. I can talk about him at great length. Knew and met Mahan at 1899 Hague Conference. And Mahan actually seems to take on an awful lot of his ideas. Uh, most particularly, um, he's half persuaded, more than half persuaded, that um, the, um, the moral and psychological, he's well, Bloch falls into question the moral and psychological stamina of what you might call industrial countries. Uh, and uh, Mahan actually adopts this idea. Um, the, the, the whole message of interdependence and interconnection is very much popularized uh, by Norman Angel, uh, a British journalist uh, who wrote a book that sold about two million copies before the First World War. Uh, Mahan is saying exactly the same thing as Ivan Bloch. And this is the real difference between Corbett and Mahan. You know, Mahan sees that the world economic system is fundamentally dynamic and that the interruption of flows, as opposed to stocks, flows can produce serious and significant results. Um, the, uh, he, he sees that the maritime system, as it were, is the biggest and best wealth generation machine that exists on the planet. And he insists it must be protected at all costs. Corbett doesn't see any of this. Um, he thinks in terms of stocks, not flows. He thinks that wealth is largely a function of um, uh, the produce of land resource, uh, explo exploitation of land resources, very much Mackinderite, uh, you know, rather than anybody who believes in sea uh, power. Um, if I could say one last thing is, is that yes, uh, Mahan may be a visionary, uh, but uh, he doesn't absolutely, he didn't see everything. You know, he, 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 he sees the outline. 
uh, clearly enough to see the essential characteristics and the dimensions of what he's looking at, but he can't necessarily see all the detail. Um, and uh, yeah, he didn't see what, uh, what uh, a number of uh, British strategists uh, involved in uh, developing plans for economic warfare before 1914 actually saw. Uh, which was a plan to basically marry sea power to the exploitation of effective British monopoly control of the infrastructure of the global trading system, which is ships, financial services, communications. Uh, the idea of which was to basically, at the beginning of the war, it's uh, uh, one person called the British uh, Schlieffen Plan, another has very cleverly, new um, exact in Monterey, Brits Creek, really would rather wish I'd thought of that. Um, in any case, uh, there is this plan that uh, is put into effect in 1914 uh, to basically isolate Germany from the global trading system. In, uh, the idea being is just to collapse their underpinning financial systems and bring about an entire collapse or at least push their society towards uh, collapse and uh, uh, lead to uh, political settlements in 1914. But, uh, the reality was is that the strategists of Britain seriously underestimated, um, number one, the level of global panic that tended the beginning of the war. You know, everyone thinks that 1931 or 2008 is the greatest economic crash in the last, 19, uh, last 100 years. It isn't. It's 1914. That's the big one. Um, and they seriously underestimated uh, the resistance uh, from other stakeholders, both domestic and foreign. Uh, you know, you mess with the global economic system and you're risking economic Armageddon, and that's something very few politicians uh, are uh, willing to risk. Um, so yes, it's easy enough to come up with this trip. Uh, well, it's not easy, but uh, it is possible enough uh, to become up with a coherent strategic plan, uh, but it is not at all easy to implement. So uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, Mahan may well not be enough, but uh, he isn't necessarily good. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Bud? Well, thanks very much. I'd like to particularly thank the uh, Naval War College for inviting me to uh, be here today. I'm really honored. I, I, also, as you can see on the screen, I usually have this disclaimer I have to give, but I've started giving a second disclaimer when I talk about the Chinese Navy, which is I'm not Chinese. And as, as Jim can attest, uh, finding out what the Chinese are thinking in maritime terms, uh, what they really mean, is, is something of a daunting task. Uh, I was asked today to reflect on the influence of uh, current maritime strategic thought, and I was first going to use the term venerables, and then I uh, realized that there was a certain religious connotation to that, which led me to remember Henry Stimson's famous quote here about the, the U.S. Navy. Um, with respect to maritime strategy generally, what I discovered when I, I looked at as many maritime strategies in the Asia Pacific as I could in uh, writing my recent book on the topic, I did, I, I'm firmly convinced that uh, just about all maritime strategies are really, at least the ones that are published, are written as much for domestic and service competition political purposes as they are to provide any real guidelines to, to naval officers or, or maritime leaders of any sort. And I'll note here that the, the Canadian maritime strategy struck me as particularly apt Probably the best, in terms of guidelines for real operations at sea, the best maritime strategy I came across was published by Bangladesh, hardly a, a maritime power. Um, in, terms of, in terms of China, the, the maritime nature of the, of the nation is, is obvious. Uh, not only with respect to the, to the long coastline and the many islands they possess and claim, but also to the uh, incredible importance of the rivers, especially if we look at the Tibetan Plateau, where the Yellow River and the, uh, the uh, uh, Yangtze and the uh, Mekong and other rivers all have their headwaters. It's an amazing demonstration of how important in the international arena this particular aspect of maritime power uh, can become. I'll also note here that uh, one of the areas of concern to the Chinese Navy, uh, certainly in the future anyway, are the sea lines of communications. And I'll point out that the sea line of communication from uh, Shanghai to the Persian Gulf is over 5,000 nautical miles. Probably too hard to defend in the World War II, World War I classical sense, but we'll speak more about that here in a moment. Uh, 
I tried to come up with some, first I said dates, and then I realized some formulative points that would contribute to uh, Chinese conceptions of maritime strategies. I mentioned the importance of maritime trade, not just energy, although that's, in, that's increasingly important, that is the seaborne importation of energy, uh, but also in historic terms. Although China historically has been a continentalist power, and the army today still dominates uh, the Chinese military, uh, the idea about defending against barbarians uh, remains pertinent. Uh, when I lead students on the China trips, and we're always accompanied by a couple of guys from the uh, Foreign Affairs Office of the Ministry of Defense, we refer to them fondly as our barbarian watchers. Uh, there have been times during China's history when uh, navies have been raised, but for rather discreet purposes. And of course, perhaps the most famous is during the Ming Dynasty, when they overthrow the Yuan, and then later during the voyages of Zheng He. Although I quick to, I'm quick to add that the, uh, to editorialize that the constant Chinese claims that Zheng He was a demonstration of the peaceful use of Chinese military power is nonsense in my view. If you read Ed Dreyer's book on what Zheng He actually did as he uh, traversed the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, it's hard to overestimate the importance from a maritime strategic view of first ad general, then admiral, then general again, Luo Ha Ching. Uh, he was in power basically from um, 1982 to 1997, either as commander of the Navy or as one of the two most important uniformed individuals in the Chinese military. That was long enough, I think, for him to make the necessary changes against the inert bureaucracy. Any bureaucracy has a certain amount of inertia. Sergei Gorshkov in the Soviet Union was in command of the Navy long enough, I think, to, to turn the bureaucracy. Uh, in the United States, Elmo Zomwa was not. I mean, he made some significant changes, but in four years of CNO, if he'd been CNO for 10 or 15 years, I suspect we would have seen some really dramatic, uh, increasingly dramatic changes uh, in, in the Navy. Uh, I think it was during his tenure in the 1990s, especially spurred by the 1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis, that he really gained importance for the Navy in China. And we all have read about his three-phase strategy and so forth, uh, nailed to dates 2000, 2020, 2050. I think the real purpose of his writings had very little to do with the international regime, but really more was w internal to the PLA in an attempt to try to gain resources and stature for the Navy, in which he, th his success is just now, I think, in the last few years being evidenced in China. Uh, I also note 2003, you may recall that the Chinese found a Ming-class submarine floating half submerged uh, with the crew all dead inside, probably from a, a ventilation lineup problem. Uh, that really caused a very significant, even a major reorganization of the supply procedures and the maintenance procedures within the Chinese Navy. They fired everybody from the Navy commander on down, uh, instituted for the first time centralized, a centralized supply system, and also began a PMS, plan maintenance system type uh, organization within the Navy. Uh, 2008 is important because of the Gulf of Aden deployments. Uh, the, the date that Luo Ha Cheng apparently wrote about for China being able to establish sea control out to the first island chain, I've got a chart here in a moment of that, uh, is usually given as 2000. They didn't meet that date. They probably by 2020 are pretty close to it. Uh, the second date, uh, 2049 or 2050, would establish the Chinese capability to, for sea control out to the second island chain. Now, I use sea control advisedly, not command of the sea, or maybe not even sea control in the, in the terms employed by Mahan or Corbett, because I think what the Chinese are doing is trying not to take on the U.S. Navy or any other Navy one-on-one, -on -one, but rather to be able to apply maritime force sufficient to attain very specific strategic objectives at a very specific time, whether it be Taiwan, the East China Sea, or the South China Sea. Some of the phrases uh, assigned with that, and one we re read most often about is anti-access area denial, A2AD. Uh, there's nothing new about this concept. I would argue that uh, Jefferson with his gunboat navy, President Thomas Jefferson, Japan during World War II, the Soviet Union during the later stages of the Cold War, all tried to establish an A2AD sort of strategy and all failed. We we'll have to see what happens in, in this case. I'll also mention two other word, phrases we read about a lot, that is offshore defense and active defense. And this is sort of China's twist on Clausewitz's theory of uh, the offense and defense. Uh, what it means is what we might consider offense, the Chinese would consider defense. And as I constantly remain, uh, remind my students, this is important if we try to estimate what, the China, what Beijing may do 
in reaction to specific other foreign nations' uh, moves. I'll also note that the, uh, that the term, uh, that the 2049 uh, date is important. If we look at the current president of China, Xi Jinping, who's been talking about his China dream, largely undefined, but apparently based on the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China uh, in 1949. So I think this is a significant date. The core interests that concern Chinese maritime strategists have been defined by uh, Xi Jinping as, quote, state sovereignty, national security, territorial integrity, and national reunification, obviously meaning Taiwan, China's political system established by the Constitution, overall social stability, and it goes on. That really all boils down, the last phrase all boils down to keeping the Chinese Communist Party in power. And these other uh, points you see up here are self-explanatory, except uh, I don't think there is any Malacca dilemma. That's referred to by Chinese analysts with the thought that if the U.S. or somebody else closed down the Strait of Malacca, really the Straits of Singapore and Malacca, that it would somehow starve China's energy imports. Well, in fact, only about 10% of China's daily energy needs come from imported oil. Uh, and second of all, as many of you realize, this, the Strait of Malacca is depth limited, and many of the larger tankers have to steam elsewhere when they, they uh, enter the South China Sea or, or go on up to uh, Northeast Asia. But what's important is not the facts of the Malacca Dilemma. What's important is if the perception of a Malacca Dilemma exists in Beijing, then it will spur a further maritime strategic thought. Now these are the, uh, the famous island chains we read about. I'll point out that the distance from uh, Shanghai to Okinawa is uh, about 450 nautical miles, and from Shanghai to Guam, is 1,670 nautical miles. These are very large maritime areas in which to uh, try to exert sea control. But I point out that today I'm convinced that China's maritime strategy is based on the ability to control the sea within the three seas, or the near seas, East China Sea, South China Sea, and the Yellow Sea. And that their second island chain is really based on the thought that by the mid-century, when the Chinese military is supposedly mature and finally modernized, they'll be able to exert sea control out this nearly 1,800 miles uh, to the line you see there. And these lines swing west through the Indonesian archipelago. Um, for the first time, I was reading a Chinese document about two weeks ago and for the first time saw the area within the second island chain uh, referred to as the Middle Sea. So near seas, middle seas, and beyond the second island chain uh, as the far seas. This slide shows uh, some quotes by some of the, the leaders of China, all of whom have emphasized the, uh, the necessity of a strong navy, although I'll mention that both, that didn't change, sorry. there we go, that Mao Zedong and uh, Deng Xiaoping both considered the navy to only be a, a supporting arm of the army. Uh, this is only now beginning to change. Uh, Deng Xia, or Xi Jinping has said that there's going to be a leveling of the effort, if you will, uh, among the three services with the indication that the, Ar the Navy and the Air Force and the Second Artillery uh, will all be gaining uh, manpower and resources. Uh, we had a senior military region commander come to National Defense University last fall who indicated the same thing in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, but nonetheless, as of right now, the Army remains dominant in terms of command positions uh, and certainly manpower. Resources are, have, have already shifted to a degree to the Navy and Air Force simply because of the expenses of the ships and aircraft and so forth. Influences on Chinese maritime strategy? I mean, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz probably never saw an ocean. Uh, but nonetheless, both are certainly studied at the, uh, at the various professional military education institutions in China, and, and both have a certain amount of influence. Uh, the Chinese certainly studied the U.S. Navy, particularly uh, John Lehman's uh, 1986 maritime strategy and the efforts since the end of the Cold War to come up with something equally meaningful. Efforts I don't think have been very successful. Uh, and I cannot emphasize enough the importance not only of geography, and from the Chinese Navy strategist's point of view, the island change remained dominant in their thoughts, perhaps too dominant. Uh, but also the importance of domestic and PLA politics in China. The PLA Navy, uh, like most navies, certainly like the U.S. Navy, uh, has to struggle for resources and manpower. 
Uh, when I served on the Navy staff, I thought the immediate enemy was not the Soviets, but really the U.S. submarine force. I also have to note that uh, the Chinese learned from these strategists. I'll mention Sun Tzu's emphasis on deception, which certainly plays into the informationization, information warfare emphasis we see in Chinese maritime strategic thought today. However, I would caution that I think Sun Tzu uh, seems to assume too much that, that events can be controlled. And I think the Chinese military is prone today, dangerously prone, uh, to establishing or participating in a situation that would lead to unintended escalation, uh, particularly with respect today to the East, the East China Sea dispute with Japan. I'll also mention that certainly Clausewitz and Mahan are more realistic, I think, about the dangers of unintended consequences at sea, uh, going along with uh, Nelson's supposed statement that, quote, nothing is certain in a sea fight. Uh, I also note that China's emphasis on the land features in the East and South China Seas evokes uh, Admiral J.C. Wiley's comments on the importance of power projection ashore. I use the term in my paper, organizational strategist. Uh, and I think we, we often don't pay enough attention to this. I think if we look in, in our terms, Arlie Burke and Elmo Zomo and John Lehman, although you don't often think about those guys as maritime strategists per se, certainly were able to change the organization. And in, in China, not only Liu Haqing, but also more recently, uh, Shi Yunshang and Wu Shengli, as commanders of the Chinese Navy, have been able to establish real differences, whether it be in rather pedestrian terms of resources and management, but changes that have had impact on the way the Chinese will strategically be able to use their, their force. Uh, I've written three books on the Chinese maritime, the Navy or maritime strategic thought. The first one I basically completed writing in 2000, the second one in 2009, and then the third one about a year ago. Uh, this is what I wrote in 1999 in a paper, and I think over the course of, what, almost 15 years now, China has in fact been developing a Navy has been, de fact, in fact, developing a maritime strategy, de facto, not written, at least not published, uh, that we now have to pay attention to. I think the best way to look at that maritime strategy in writing is the 1998 Ocean Policy Statement and also the various defense white papers that have uh, come out. I close by noting, however, that while China today is attempting to become a maritime as well as a continental power, and they have this de facto maritime strategy that when President Xi Jinping thinks, wakes up in the morning, the first thing he thinks about is not Taiwan or the United States or Japan. The first thing he thinks about is, as Thomas o, Tip O'Neill once said, all politics is local. He thinks about domestic problems in China. This doesn't mean we don't have to pay increasing attention to the Chinese Navy and maritime strategic thought, but I do think we have to keep it in perspective. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bud. Barney? Uh, good morning. Um, my paper that's posted on the website and is one of the working papers is a summary of an article I uh, published in the autumn 2013 Naval War College Review and, and deals with the evolution of U.S. Navy peacetime deployments, which are themselves manifestations of U.S. policy, grand strategy, such as, is, as it's been at any given moment. And of course, the maritime component to all of that, which we call, rightly or wrongly, maritime strategy. I've also got an article coming out in an upcoming Proceedings magazine that reflects broadly on U.S. maritime strategies. And I'm going to blend the main ideas from it and my conference paper into this brief reflection on maritime strategy. The main idea here is simply that the big picture, the forest, as it were, of U.S. maritime strategy consists of being forward with, with capability. The specific reasons for doing this have shifted over the years as geopolitical conditions have, have changed, but the central fact of presence has remained constant. I think it's worthwhile as we contemplate a post-Crimea world that we consider why this is so. We have to admit that the U.S. pays a pretty penny for maintaining powerful naval forces forward. This presence has been a fact of life for so long that it's easy to take it for granted, a geopolitical terrain feature, as it were. 
It's really useless to try to cal and calculate the return on investment for this massive expenditure of money, manpower, and diplomatic effort. Uh, any number of folks have tried, but without success in my view. Uh, in my view, the term investment does not get at the true nature of our strategy. I believe the motivation for sending naval forces forward lies at the intersection of what the U.S. is as a nation and the physical geography of the world. There's no time here to give this idea sufficient development, but let me just touch on a couple points. The U.S. maritime strategy forest is emergent, not designed. All the strategy documents, budgets, and plans that have been crafted over the years are the trees. Looking back over them, we see an underlying congruity despite their differences in structure, style, resources, and technology that underpin them. I believe this congruity stems from the fact that the U.S. is founded on institutions, not on bloodlines, culture, language, or any of the other discriminators that define individual nations elsewhere. Whereas con continental powers like Russia seek security through buffering, the U.S. has sought security through relationships based on trade and defense and other issues in different proportions depending on the era. More especially, the U.S. has attempted to pursue security through the establishment of supranational institutions. Institutionalization of security is a natural American reflex that is aided and abetted by the simple geographic fact that the, to uh, kind of quote McCoy, Kinder, uh, that the seas are all connected. Richly endowed with all the factors Alfred Thayer Mahan identifies as building blocks of sea power, see I invoked him, the U.S. has been at liberty to pursue its institutional agenda, which uh, of course the State Department would tell you is a rules-based international order. And this has been done consistently over the broad sweep of our history. The U.S. Navy is simply the handmaiden of this agenda. So long as this is who we are as a nation, the U.S. Navy will be out and about aiding and abetting. Keeping this assessment in mind, uh, I'm going to speculate a little bit on uh, potential U.S. strategies going forward in view of a more assertive Russia and, and China. The first option, of course, is to try and maintain the status quo, and why not? The uh, U.S. primacy is kind of the high road to our institutional agenda. In this option, the Navy stays forward with credible combat power to contain expansionism and to try to engage and bring the revisionist power back, powers back into the system. It should be noted that whatever rebalance to Asia we might have been trying to execute is now kind of overcome by events, not that I ever thought rebalance to Asia was a good idea in the first place. Uh, the U.S. wants an institutionalized globe, so the U.S. Navy must act out its role in a global basis. If the status quo is too rich for our blood, then one possibility is to make some kind of grand security deal with Russia and China. God knows they would only be too happy to lock in their own regional hegemony. We might, for instance, let them buffer locally, but then in turn they would assent to not expanding their security zones beyond agreed upon limits. The Navy backs off, staying outside the EEZs defined by the new baselines. Such a deal may ensure peace in our time, but of course it means that we abandon our institutional agenda and leave a lot of people to the tender mercies of dictators. If that option is too smelly for us, we might consider trying to reshuffle the uh, geopolitical cards, so to speak. Uh, George Friedman of Stratford just had an article on this this morning um, talking about a, a new kind of uh, defensive uh, arrangement, not NATO, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, what we would do is put together a new arrangement of allies, perhaps uh, ranging from Estonia to Azerbaijan and including others in Southeast Asia. Uh, as a, a globalized defensive consortium, uh, or a series of them, could make some, take some of the deployment pressure off the U.S. Navy, perhaps allowing it to functionally specialize. The U.S. could still pursue its institutional agenda within the bounds of a more redefined security community. One might expect as a consequence, however, the formation of a new third world over which there would be great power competition, and this would necessi necessitate yet different patterns of U.S. Navy deployment. Finally, there could be true retrenchment with the fleet coming home to enforce some new edition of the Monroe Doctrine. The Navy would sortie overseas episodically, responding to intolerable acts, direct attacks, or the occasional diplomatic uh, opportunity. In fact, a version of this option, which we called offshore balancing, 
was presented to a flag panel back in 2007 in conjunction with CS21 development. They rejected it out of hand, which I think reflected both the geopolitical conditions of the time and also the deep-seated culture of forward deployment that exists in the U.S. Navy. But even in a retrenchment scenario, the issue of freedom of the seas cannot simply be set aside. Commerce must flow and the U.S. Navy must be able to go where needed in order to support U.S. interests. In the 19th century, American commerce and indeed the Navy moved about at the pleasure of the Royal Navy. I cannot conceive of a situation in which we would allow movement on the seas to be dictated by either the PLAN or the Voina Morsky flow. So in the end, the U.S. Navy will have to deploy in some way, shape, or form. So I suppose all I've done in this short expose is to state the obvious, but perhaps the obvious is only so if you actually state it. The problem with sea power is that when it is successful, it becomes invisible. The agent as much for what does not happen as for what does happen. This is another reason the U.S. maritime strategy writ large is emergent and not designed. That said, the current maritime strategy document, CS21, is a step in the direction of design. Whereas the 1980s maritime strategy was contingent, specifying what the USN would do if the Soviets attacked, and the 1990s uh, from the sea series of white papers were doctrinal, talking about joint warfare in the literal without specifying who, why, what, or where, um, CS21 is systemic. It's designed to be executed 24-7, 365. The purposes behind CS21 offer us a clue as to why a forward deployed Navy servant to U.S. institutionalism will most likely remain forward regardless of U.S. future grand strategy direction. The idea with CS21 is to create a global maritime partnership to secure the seas against terrorist smuggling. The job is too large for the U.S. alone. It needs collaborating navies to share information, and this only works in an institutionalized world. CS-21 sets the stage for this by asserting the U.S. sea services deployed to defend the global system. This is something that raises all kinds of ire within uh, the Beltway. Uh, but this statement generated the necessary political capital overseas that in turn produced the emergence of regional maritime domain awareness system, whether it be Brazil CISTRAM, uh, TRMN from Italy, MSSIS from Singapore, uh, Sukbas from uh, Sweden, etc. Uh, America is now safer because of this emergent, but the underlying glue to all this is a globally deployed, powerful U.S. Navy. Defense of the global system as a declarative maritime strategy is perhaps the ultimate expression of the intimate intertwining of American institutionalism, its sea power, and the singular nature of the world ocean. So long as America is what it is, the Navy will be out there, wherever there might be, but not here. What the Navy shows up with there in, will be a matter of technology and available resources, but it will be there. That is our maritime strategy, peace or war. Thanks, Barney. Let me uh, comment uh, just briefly on each one of the uh, each one of the papers, and uh, perhaps pose a question that uh, the authors might like to to follow up on. Uh, I actually resent uh, that Nick's uh, writing a paper that I could find very little to uh, disagree with. Uh, in fact, I spend a lot of time uh, trying to, to come to up with something to nitpick him on. Uh, so I think I'm going to do it by uh, he's, he has a, he has attacked the he's attacked the English theorists, and I'm going to say a word on behalf of the Anglo of the English theorist uh, Corbett. Uh, my hand's portrait is undoubtedly smiling if we step out into the rotunda right now. I, in my view, the, the, both of the theorists really missed an opportunity to come up with a unified theory of, of maritime operations and, and sea power. Uh, and the, the, way he, the way Nick puts it in his paper is almost verbatim the way I put it when I talk to my students here at the War College about the relationship between these two theorists. Uh, to me, it seems that, as Nick says, not, not quite in these terms, but, uh, but uh, my hand operates on the, on the level of the logic of sea power, whereas Corbett operates down at the grammatical level, talks about how to implement a vision of commerce bases and ships to use uh, uh, my hand's famous shorthand for what sea power is. Uh, so that's point one. I, it's, I, I actually wish that Mahan, instead of writing naval strategy in 1911, would have sat down and, done so, and, and essentially condensed his thoughts about sea power into one volume. 
Similarly, it would have been really, really great if uh, Corbett had managed to, to, to uh, come up with a volume in which he sketched his vision of what sea power was in grand terms, as well as how to execute a, a maritime strategy. So, but uh, so I, I guess I don't disagree with your note, your idea that Mahan is the best we have, but uh, it, it does it does raise the idea that we we would be better off if one of these theorists had really taken on this uh, this great task. Uh, secondly, and here's the here's the point that I think we might I might disagree with you on just slightly. You, you pay a lot of attention to Corbett's views of the economic system, and I, I would I think I would come back at you just a little bit by saying that did Corbett really need to justify what Great Britain was doing at the time, uh, as far as maintaining that network of commerce bases and ships overseas? Did he really feel the need to 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 uh, justify what Britain had been doing for many decades and, and, and centuries? So it's, so it's a status quo power. Clearly, Britain was just trying to defend what it had. And the specific point that, uh, that you called attention to in your paper comes from the text of Corbett, where you talk about, uh, you, you suggest that he is actually uh, downgrading uh, commerce protection as a, as a function of sea power. And you, you, I, I went back and looked at the, at the word that you used, deflection. Terrible, terrible word in our, in our uh, current, uh, current uh, way of using the English language. In the, he's, and uh, Nick suggests, I think, that uh, Corbett was saying that this is just a sideshow. Commerce protection is a sideshow in maritime strategy. In fact, uh, what Corbett is, what he's actually doing is he's, he's discussing the difference between maritime warfare and land warfare and pointing out that in, in, in distinction to uh, land armies, uh, navies also have this other function. Not only do they have to go out and seek the enemy's fleet for battle, but they also, do, they also have to think about protecting commerce as well. And in fact, and in fact he points out, he's, he's rather uh, out, for, out in front saying that not only commerce, but also just politics in general, always impinges on the conduct of maritime warfare. So I, I, I took this to be my, a, more operational than a, a more operational point than a comment on the nature of the economic system. You, you might want to comment on that and see if, see if we could come to some meeting of the minds there. Uh, and I, think, I, think that's, I think that's it for Nick's paper. Let me move on to just say, or at least pose a couple of questions for Bud's paper, which I, which I enjoyed greatly as well. I think that uh, Bud is touching in on one of the big debates that, uh, that we have when, when discussing strategic culture. And in particular, if you relate this to the maritime realm, is there a universal logic and a universal way of doing sea power? Or is this a historic accident generated by the fact that all the great uh, theories of sea power have been developed during the era of Western dominance, which I suppose you could trace back about 500 years, depending on how you want to count it. And if you relate to this, this to China, it, it appears, and it Bud suggests, and I think that I've uh, contributed to this as well, we are suggesting that China is imp importing or perhaps re-importing Western, Western ideas about sea power. What, 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 how, does that, how does that work, Bud? I mean, to, to, I mean, you suggest quite clearly that the island chains are, and this use of geographic features is foreign to, to uh, theories of sea power. But is that, but is that just uh, foreign to Western theories of sea power, or is, are, we, are we likely to see something very different emerge in Asia as China raise, rises to maritime eminence, perhaps India rises to maritime eminence? You know, how, how, how are these ideas going to shake out, and what, what is Chinese maritime strategy going to look like over the long haul? Uh, oh, and just a second question. I just I thought I would try to draw you into a, a contemporary debate. Uh, John Mearsheimer, a couple of weeks ago, out at the University of Chicago, suggested that China has no significant military power and that we should say goodbye to Taiwan. And I, I just wonder, just wondering whether, what, you, what you think about, I don't know if you saw that article in the National Interest, but uh, I just thought, I thought I'd try to draw you in and get you to say something inflammatory about that, or perhaps not. <laughs> And finally, let me move on to Barney's paper. I, I, I very much enjoyed the way that he read, that he spelled out several different pot potential futures for the United States moving ahead. Uh, for example, I think his idea of a grand bargain, we could, we could actually call that a reversion to, uh, to the four policemen theory of, of, of Franklin Roosevelt leading into the foundation of the UN Security Council. The idea that the big powers would police their own neighborhoods uh, and essentially get along that way. And I think Barney also suggested, and I fully agree with this, that that's fine as long as the policemen agree on what the laws are that they're enforcing. If the, if the policemen have very different visions of what uh, maritime order they are enforcing, I think you could run into a serious uh, quarrel and, and really have a, have a prospect for some, uh, some uh, bad times ahead. Uh, and so on and so forth. They, if, I guess my question for you, Barney, is that in, if, we, if we bring in Clausewitz briefly and talk about the trinity, the trinity of chance and probability, the trinity of uh, of great passions and the trinity of uh, rational subordination of policy or of strategy to policy, rather, 
How do you how do you fill in that? Given that sea power is invisible, as you said, to, in the popular eye, how do you fill in that passion to degree? What if, if if I'm the CNO, the Secretary of the Navy, or whoever? How do I sustain popular support and support among the allies for these for these various models of uh, of our maritime future? Because I I'm not I'm not sure I know the answer, so I'm hoping that you will provide us with some wisdom on this on this point. And with that, why don't we just uh, run back down the down the uh, line, and I'll let you all. Uh, Comment as you as you see fit. Well, nothing more boring than two academics debating some point of minutia on any <laughs> particular subject. So I'll keep it very short. Um, what I think, we, what, what, I, what I try to say is, is that um, Corbett, yes, he addresses the question of uh, economics. He talks about it in his book, and he talks about commerce prevention, but he's inconsistent in places contradictory. Uh, and my point is, is I think where I phrased it was, he's uncomfortable with the subject. And this is uh, particularly apparent. I'm not going so much by his theoretical textbook of 1911 as by his earlier historical works, where his treatment of uh, broader economic issues uh, is rather weak. And uh, I don't do the Tudor Navy and I'm beyond. Um, it's, he isn't in command of this subject. He, you know, he understands the politics of the diplomatic aspects, but uh, when it comes to economics, uh, he struggles to spell the word in my opinion. <laughs> well, Jim, thanks very much. Um, uh, that's a great question, a universal way of doing sea power. I, I, I'm tempted to say yes uh, in, in the, the broadest sense of the word because I don't believe in some of the writings about China having this unique way of warfare, unique war culture, the idea of an assassin's mace and so forth. Uh, or asymmetric warfare. I mean, what, what intelligent military commander doesn't try to seek out his opponent's weakness and attack it? Uh, with respect to the island change and, uh, and the three seas, uh, I think this is being used, as I, as I noted, by, the, by Chinese naval planners with respect to the national strategic objectives that I referred to in core national interest. Number one, still being Taiwan. I think that's why China has developed uh, such a powerful, conventionally powered submarine force over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, but if we look at what's happening economically and politically between Taiwan and the mainland, it's particularly with the meeting about a month ago in Nanjing between, uh, for the first time since 1949, official government representatives of each body. Uh, I think the Taiwan issue is, is decreasing in the possibility of, of, uh, of turning into a military conflict. And I would suggest that by 2020, 2025 at the very latest, uh, the PLAN will no longer be terribly concerned about a possible conflict involving Taiwan. Uh, this, of course, goes uh, to the point that if I were a young PLAN commander in Beijing today and had been tasked by the Navy commander with justifying continued budget increases by the PLA headquarters and by the national budget, I'd be, I'd be looking beyond Taiwan, even beyond the East China Sea, South China Sea possibilities, and looking perhaps at, at trying to, to justify uh, guarding the sea lines of communications as a justifiable mission for the, uh, for the Chinese Navy. I mentioned earlier that during the Ming Dynasty and at other times in China's history, it's developed a Navy, but then basically decommissioned it after the emergency of the moment or of the decade. I don't think that's going to happen this time. But I do think that the Chinese Navy is going to have to find uh, strategic reasons for its continued modernization and expansion. Uh, I disagree with, uh, with Mearsheimer in general. <laughs> we had John at, the, at, the, at NWC a, a few years ago to, to that point. Uh, and I mentioned, but however, Hugh White in Australia, just very recently, within the last week or two, has published another of a series of things he's been publishing on the same point. The idea being that the US and China should establish some accommodation uh, in the Western Pacific. And this goes exactly Jim's point about, well, how do you establish the rules? You can't establish an agreement without the rules. Uh, the idea about saying goodbye to Taiwan, I think, is, is irrelevant at this point. I think Taiwan is on its way sort of out of the American orbit. Uh, one last point I'll make is on sea power being invisible or visible. It's not invisible to the Chinese people, as we've seen recently. The National People's Congress last year, there was lots of uh, public statements and complaints about China not having a formal maritime strategy. Now, that Congress doesn't have any real power to speak of. But nonetheless, it's an example of how aware the Chinese people are today about issues like Taiwan, potential conflict with Japan, and with the Philippines and others in the, in the East and South China Seas. Thank you. Uh, 
let me just add to that, Bud. Uh, uh, when I've talked to uh, Chinese counterparts, uh, uh, more than once I've heard suggestions of a big two arrangement that we would uh, work things out. Maybe someday uh, some kind of accommodation would be possible, but uh, the rules would going to be the problem. Uh, concerning popular support, you know, uh, when back in uh, 2006, 2007, when we were working on this um, a cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power, we embarked on this uh, big uh, program of what uh, we call conversation with the country. And uh, we took some of our best and brightest uh, uh, from the college S&P department, went out there and senior officers and engaged in these uh, meetings, uh, both on a broad level and then uh, smaller seminars with corporate bigwigs uh, all over the country, and this absolutely without success. Uh, so uh, the public tends to respond to uh, uh, emergencies, uh, not you know trying to stir them up when everything's going fine uh, is probably a, a bridge too far. Um, there is, however, this legend among naval officers and, and uh, naval uh, cognoscenti, uh, especially within the Beltway, that there is some adept concoction of words in a maritime strategy document that will open the purse strings of Congress. Um, this, I think, uh, partly comes from Mahan. You know, the, who wrote? Hattendorf would know that uh, uh, at one point uh, somebody said that uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, opened and read uh, Mahan's uh, uh, Influence of Sea Power in History and closed the book A Changed Man. Uh, and then there's the uh, legend surrounding the uh, 1980s maritime strategy in the 600 ship Navy. People seem to think that the strategy was the cause of the 600 ship Navy when it was actually the other way around if you talk to the guys that actually crafted it. So there's this legend out there that some uh, uh, artfully articulated maritime strategy will uh, produce uh, support for the US Navy. Uh, I don't believe so. CS-21, for its part, was built not for really a US audience, but for an overseas audience. Uh, we had to depict the US on the uh, defensive, uh, strategic defensive, which we succeeded in doing, and that, that ended up uh, generating some support around the world. So it was not a comprehensive maritime strategy document. It had its purposes. It served its purposes. I watched the struggles OPNAV has been going through for the last two and a half years trying to concoct a new strategy, and I go, ah, it's too hard. Yeah, I appreciate your candor, your candor about the conversations with the country. I was uh, I was down at Athens, Georgia, at the University of Georgia at that point, and uh, I, heard, I didn't hear about the conversation with the country that was in Atlanta until well after the fact. I just happened to stumble across it in the in the local paper. I, uh, I actually, I, I'm not going to come back to your comeback, but to the, I think uh, that you, you raise a good point. Even Mahan himself conceded in his own memoirs that. Uh, he, he did all this writing in a, in a, with, with an agenda. I mean, he was trying to muster support for a, for a big navy in the 1890s and around into the into the early 20th century. But he can, he also conceded, uh, very frankly, that it took the Spanish-American War to really give any to give the, what he was had been writing about sea power any resonance with the with the American populace. So it's a, even even the greats uh, wrestle with this uh, question about how to sustain popular support. And with that, uh, I think we, st we still have about 25 minutes, uh, so thanks for everybody for keeping within the timelines, and uh, I'll just uh, throw it up for, for Q&A.